So today we are going to be talking about positive feedback circuits, uh, but I want to talk about why we need a positive feedback circuit first. So I made a slight modification. Oh my goodness, why is this doing this again? I made a slight modification to the circuit that we developed in the last class. Um, so I have my simple comparator circuit. Uh, and what I've done is I've added some white noise to the input signal, okay? So there's small amounts of fluctuation on our input signal. And that actually causes the comparator to behave a little bit strangely. Um, so I'm going to zoom in to one of the transition regions and we're gonna look at what happens. So I'm gonna change uh, my, my time scale and let's just look from zero to 0 0.5 seconds with 100 millisecond increments. So instead of having a nice even vertical line, we have a bunch of ringing that is occurring. And it's because if our input voltage signal isn't stable, our output signal won't be stable either because that's how an open loop op amp works. So what we can do to correct this is apply positive feedback. So, Positive feedback. Up amp. So in our previous classes, we were dealing with an open loop op amp where we had this as our signal flow diagram. We had our amplifier, we applied some input signal X of T and measured some output signal Y of T where Y of T was simply a X of T when it was operating linearly and it was either the positive power supply voltage or the negative power supply voltage when we were operating um, in the saturation regions, okay? So that was our open loop circuit. If we apply feedback, we are gonna have a slightly different um, situation. So I'm still gonna call my input signal X of T, but I'm gonna apply it over here. And X of T is gonna be fed into what we're gonna call a mixer. And that mixer supplies our input signal E of T to our amplifier. This is A, and I'm gonna write here specifically VOL to let us know that this is the open loop gain we're feeding this E signal into. And then at the output, what we're going to do is we're taking our output here, which is Y of T, but we're feeding back some of the output to the input of our amplifier. So I'm gonna call this guy right here. I'm just gonna put it as a box and say that this is our feedback network. Like so. And I'm gonna specifically state that these signals are added together. 
where this is going to be my feedback signal, I'm going to call it f of t. So this is a generic feedback network or a feedback system where we have positive feedback because some portion of the output signal is added to our input signal to generate our error signal, which is E of T. So we can analyze this guy pretty briefly. Um, so we could say that Y of T, which is our output, is AVOL, uh, and sorry, this feedback network has a parameter K, um, that's our feedback factor for the network. So uh, our output AVOL uh, is gonna be AVOL times E of T. Um, we can say that our error signal E of T is the sum of our input signal x of t and the sum of our feedback signal f of t where f of t is k times y of t. So we just have multiplication going around in that loop and what we'll find is that we can define a closed loop gain, okay? Our closed loop gain, I'm gonna call it AVCL in this case, where CL stands for closed loop, is simply the ratio of Y of T over X of T. That's the definition of it. And in this particular case, it will be AVOL divided by one minus K times AVOL. So this is what the transfer function, as we'll call it, uh, for a closed loop positive feedback amplifier is going to look like. So what does the feedback factor do in this case? Well, it makes the closed loop gain larger than the open loop gain, okay? So if we had an open loop gain of 100,000 and a feedback factor of say one half, our closed loop gain would be roughly twice our open loop gain, okay? That is going to decrease the linear range of the system meaning we're going to shift from VCC minus to VCC plus even more abruptly than we did before. But another interesting property of this positive feedback is that it's gonna provide latching or memory to our circuit. So let me explain how we could apply positive feedback to an op answer specifically. So if we have a regular op amp circuit, here's our positive supply voltage VCC plus, here's our negative supply voltage VCC minus. For our non-inverted comparator, we applied our reference voltage at our inverting input terminal. What we are going to do now is apply a feedback loop. So we're gonna have some resistor placed between the non-inverting, excuse me, the, yeah, the non-inverting input terminal and the output terminal. I'm gonna call this resistor R2. Here's where we measure our output signal. Essentially as a function of time. And then we're 
we're going to apply some resistor R1 between our input signal source and our non-inverting input oh. terminal. So this bit right here is what that feedback network labeled as K in our above circuit represents or in our above signal flow diagram represents is just this simple combination of resistors. So let's analyze exactly what this circuit does. Actually, I take that back. Let's simulate what this circuit does first, and then we'll circle back around to doing some analysis because it'll be easier to understand what's going on. If we... So I'm gonna go into LT Spice. Uh, trying to remember how to stop. Well, I'll just let it run, I guess, for a moment. All right. So what I need to do is close this out for now and apply my feedback network, which means I'm going to need to delete this guy. Let me make this larger. I'm going to apply some resistance and we'll put R1 there and R2 down here and wire things up. And let's see, I'm going to apply VN2, which is my signal with noise, to my output. And now I have to pay attention particularly to set my upper and lower trigger limits to something that's useful. Uh, so I'm going to start here with, let's say, a 2K and a 1K and see if it behaves in a way that I think it should. Possibly. Yeah, okay. So we can see that our input signal is still very, very noisy, but our output signal is now a clean looking square wave, okay? But there is a slight change in the behavior of this circuit. So I'm gonna make this guy bigger. So we can see that our output didn't go positive until our input signal was somewhere around four volts, okay? and our output signal didn't go low until our input signal was somewhere around two and a half volts. We can develop mathematical relationships to get this explicitly, um, but we have fundamentally altered how this guy is behaving because we're no longer directly comparing it to the reference voltage, right? Our reference voltage of three volts for our comparator said that anything above three gives us a high output and anything below three gives us a low output, and that is not exactly what we are seeing here. Uh, instead, we're seeing latching. So we go high above some specific value, and it stays high until we go below a specific value, and then it stays low for some time, and then it just uh, goes back and forth between those two states. So let's mathematically figure out what is going on here. I'm going to draw 
my practical op amp model representation for this circuit because it's going to help us figure out what's going on here. Um, so let's start. This is going to be my non inverting input terminal. Here's my resistance Rn, whatever it may be. Here is my inverting input terminal. Dependent source. This is my ground. This is still going to be AVOL times my differential voltage VD, where VD, as always, is defined to be the voltage drop um, across my input resistance, so V plus minus V minus. Here's my output resistance. Our out. Um, so between my inverting input terminal and ground, I have that voltage VREF. And between my non-inverting input terminal and ground, I have a resistor R1 in series with my input signal, Vn of P. Um, and I also have feedback, right? So between my inverting input terminal and my output terminal, I have some resistor R2. And then finally, measure my output voltage at my output terminal like that. So this um, practical op amp model representation of our circuit is a little bit more complicated than what we've done previously because it has that feedback. So the first thing I want to ask you guys is, does anybody have any questions about how I developed this practical op amp model based on the schematic representation I have above. Does everything make sense? Okay. Hopefully everything makes sense, but all right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply Kirchhoff's current law at my non-inverting input and develop an equation that governs how this guy works. But I'm going to have to make two assumptions here. Okay, my first assumption is that my input resistance Rn is much, much greater than the value of my resistors R1 and R2. So by that, I mean, since the input resistance of a typical op amp is on the order of mega ohms, if my resistors R1 and R2 were kilo ohm scale, that would be sufficiently small to have this guy behave as expected. My second assumption is that my output resistance is much smaller than the value of my resistors R1 and R2, which again, if I'm using kilo ohm sized resistors for my feedback network, makes this happen. So we're just going back to what I talked about, about sizing resistors originally. But now these are gonna play a pretty important role. So I'm doing Kirchhoff's voltage law at my non-inverting input terminal. So that means I'm gonna be adding this current that I've labeled in blue, this current that I've labeled in blue, and this other current 
all labeled in blue together and setting them equal to zero. So the portion that is flowing to the left, so let me write this specifically, KCL at my non-inverting input terminal, I'm going to get V plus minus Vn divided by R1. My portion going to the right is going to be V plus minus V ref divided by Rn. And my portion on top is going to be V plus minus V out divided by R2. Set this whole thing equal to zero. So if we apply assumption number one to our Kirchhoff's current law equation, what that does is it tells us that if Rn is much, much larger than R1 and R2, the current contribution flowing through that resistor Rn should be much, much smaller than the current flowing through R1 and R2. So I can say that this current is effectively zero amps in comparison to the current flowing through R1 and R2. That only works when my resistors are much smaller than R1 and R2. So from that, I get V plus, um, let's see, times one over R1 plus is equal to Vn over R1 plus V out over R2. When I divide both sides by one over R1 plus one over R2, I'm gonna have one over one over R1 plus one over R2 on my right hand side, correct? When I do the algebra, and move this guy to the right hand side. Well, that's just the equation for two resistors in parallel, right? One, the one over the sum of the inverse of the resistors is the resistors in parallel. So that's going to give me V plus is equal to R2 divided by R1 plus R2 times Vn, where I had an R1 in the numerator and it got divided by that R1 I had in the denominator. And then similarly, I'm gonna have plus R1 over R1 plus R2 times V out. And now there's one more other thing that I need to look at real quick here, okay? If the current flowing through this resistor is zero amps, what is the relationship between V plus and V ref? That is absolutely correct. So uh, the, the suggestion is that V plus and V ref represent the exact same voltage because if there's no voltage drop over my input resistance, then VD is inherently zero, which makes those two voltages equal to each other. So I can say then that V reference is equal to R2 over R1 
plus R2 times Vn plus R1 over R1 plus R2 times V out. This is the equation that governs the behavior of our circuit. I'm gonna give our circuit a name here. It is what's called a non-inverting Mit trigger, okay? Now, it may not seem like it, but this particular equation actually has all of the information that we need built in to figure out what our trigger limits are, okay? Um, so let me go back to our graph real quick. Let it go through its thing here. So the trigger limits are the input voltages that cause the output to change from VCC plus to VCC minus or VCC minus to VCC plus, okay? So those are the point that the input points that are gonna be somewhere around our reference value um, that cause this guy to switch states, all right? So I'm gonna define the upper trigger limit or UTL to be the input voltage that causes V out to change from VCC minus to VCC plus. So it, when it triggers, the signal goes high. And then I'm gonna say that my lower trigger limit or LTL is the input voltage that causes V out to change from VCC plus to VCC minus. So it makes the output go from high to low, right? And so we can, we can solve for these specific voltage values, okay? So in our example, let's circle back around to my schematic diagram. R2 is two kilo ohms, R1 is one kilo ohm. We know that VCC plus is five volts and VCC minus is zero volts. Let me just double check that, yeah, five volts and zero volts. So using these values, I can say that, oh, and also we know that V reference was three volts. So I could say that V ref three volts is equal to, actually, let me say explicitly here, we're solving for the upper trigger limit. 
So three volts is equal to R2, which is two kilo ohms, divided by R1 plus R2. So that would be three kilo ohms times the value of our upper trigger limit plus R1, which is one kilo ohm divided by R1 plus R2, which is three kilo ohms times VCC minus, which is zero volts, right? So this is gonna tell us what voltage it takes to push the output up to VCC plus. So, calculator real quick. I should probably be able to do this in my head, but I'm not going to risk it. Um, we can solve for our upper trigger limit voltage, UTL. So I'll do that real quick. So I have three is equal to two thirds times my variable, which is X plus one third times zero, which I know I didn't need to put that in there, but I do it just to be safe. My upper trigger limit is 4.5 volts which seems reasonable based on the graph that we had. Our lower trigger limit, we use the exact same equation. Three volts is equal to two kilo ohms divided by three kilo ohms times whatever our lower trigger limit voltage value is, plus one kilo ohm over three kilo ohms. And now we put in VCC plus because we're trying to make our voltage change from VCC plus down to VCC minus. So I put in five volts here and I can solve for my lower trigger limit. And let's see, numerical solver. So now I just need to have the exact same equation, but I replace the zero with a five. And I get a lower trigger limit of exactly two volts. So let's revisit our graph. Does four and a half volts and two volts seem reasonable? Well, with all this noise, it's actually a little bit hard to tell. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to change how I plot this thing, all right? So right now it says a quantity plotted as a function of time. Instead, I'm gonna plot it as a function of V, Vn2 which is the voltage at node VN2, which is my noise voltage. This is looking, so what I have is some wacky hysteresis loop and this other thing VN2 that, ah, crap. All right, so I wanna delete that guy. So I have this wacky looking hysteresis loop. And the reason why it looks wacky right now is because uh, of the noise voltage. But we can see that there is a shift from the output signal being low at zero volts to the output signal being high at five volts at somewhere pretty darn close to four and a half volts. And similarly, we can see that there's a transition from the output being high at five volts to going low somewhere around two volts. We can see this a little bit more clearly if we, let me close this.
don't include the noise. So here's VN1, a nice simple sinusoidal signal. Let's make this go from six. to Minus six. Um, we can see it a little bit easier. I can actually go and do a couple of different things here. So I could add a trace that is just um, 4.5 volts across the board. And I'm gonna add another trace that was two volts. And I'm gonna change my axes again, six minus six. And we can see that those values of four and a half volts and two volts are exactly where this guy triggers high and low, or we could plot it as V out as a function of VN1. And now our hysteresis loop doesn't look as wacky because it doesn't have all that noise included. And we can obviously see that the triggers occur at four and a half and two volts. So our mathematical representation of how this guy behaves is correct, which is how I like to do things. I try to be uh, as right as I can most of the time. So this is a non-inverting Schmidt trigger, all right? Behaves very similarly to a comparator but we have that latching, meaning it, you know, it stays high until we get below, our input signal goes below a certain value and then it stays low until our input signal goes above a certain value. We can create a non-inverting, or excuse me, an inverting Schmidt trigger pretty easily by simply doing what we did between the difference for a non-inverting and an inverting comparator and just changing where we apply our reference signal and where we apply our input. So an inverting Schmidt trigger is going to look something like this. Power supply voltage VCC plus, power supply voltage VCC minus. We're gonna apply our input signal to our inverting input terminal. We're gonna have a feedback resistor. R2 between our non-inverting input terminal and our output, we have a resistor between our reference voltage and our inverting, excuse me, non-inverting input terminal. So again, this is exactly the same as what we had in the last example, except we have changed the location of where we apply our reference and switched it with where we apply our input. Otherwise, these are exactly identical circuits. So with that in mind, I am not going to do any analysis whatsoever because all of the analysis that I just did, all of this math up here is perfectly valid. All I have to do is change the position of VREF and VN and I'm gonna get the exact same result because it's the same circuit. So this tells me that the governing equation for my inverting Schmidt trigger is Vn is equal to R2 over R1 plus R2 times Vref plus R1 over R1 plus R2 times V out.
Our definition for upper trigger limit and lower trigger limit are exactly the same. Um, and in this case, our equation is a little bit easier because VN is representative of the upper trigger limit and lower trigger limit. So we literally just substitute numbers in, add them together, and we get our answers. There's no solving an equation at all. So it, it's less algebra to get the, the same result. So those are two very important applications of positive feedback. They eliminate noise from influencing the behavior of the comparator circuit at the trade-off of having some specific um, trigger limits instead of just one simple reference voltage. Uh, so I'm gonna assign you guys later today your first design problem. Um, I'll make it due in a couple of weeks, although to be honest, it shouldn't take you more than 10 minutes. Um, and it will be to develop a, well, I'll, I'll write it down here, but I'll make a more formal thing shortly. So you can be thinking about it. Create a one bit analog to digital converter. It outputs digital high five volts DC when VN is greater than three volts. And outputs a digital low zero volts DC when VN is less than two volts. Uh, I chose these parameters um, because of how an Arduino works, actually. Um, it's been a hot minute since you guys took your Engineering 120 series, um, but you, you might remember having to deal with the digital and analog values and all that kind of stuff. And for an Arduino, there's this weird bit of voltage band between two volts and three volts where it doesn't know whether or not to interpret it as digital high or digital low. Using a Schmidt trigger, you can force it to interpret everything above three being high and then it's gonna stay and it stays high until you get below two and then it says everything is low. So it, it, it eliminates the ambiguity of a, of a microcontroller processing a digit by forcing it to interpret everything as a high voltage over some range, and then everything is a low voltage with those latching points. So it's just a way to get around that fundamental flaw, in my opinion, of uh, an Arduino. All right, so, gosh, I've talked a lot today. All right, we have uh, one more circuit to look at today, and it is that of the A-stable multivibrator. Uh, specifically, we're going to look at an op amp. All right, so op amp, a stable multi vibrator shape. This one we're going to analyze more kind of qualitatively and the reason for it will be obvious momentarily. Um, so I'm gonna start with my simple op amp circuit, put it down here. Notice that I'm putting my inverting terminal on top, my non-inverting terminal on bottom. 
uh, but I'm still going to do VCC plus up here and VCC minus down here. So this is more in line with what you would see on your, um, whatchamacallit, LT spice. There you go. Thank you. We are going to have some positive feedback. I call this guy R1. Here is our resistor R2. And then what's interesting about this guy, among other things, is that we're also going to have negative feedback. We'll talk what much, much more about negative feedback um, starting on Monday. We'll spend several days talking about negative feedback because it has so many uses. This resistor just has a value of R. And then I'm going to put a capacitor here. And then this bottom terminal is tied to ground. And I want to be clear, it is tied to ground and not VCC minus. So VCC minus presumably, presumably could be a lower value than ground or a negative voltage and that would be okay. So uh, our output signal is taken at the output node of the op amp. So the reason that why, uh, why we are gonna analyze this circuit qualitatively is because we cannot develop an input output voltage relationship because there is no input voltage. Okay. This system uses its inherent A stability, meaning that the output will always either be VCC plus or VCC minus to generate a square wave or a rectangular series of rectangular pulses. Um, based on how much energy the capacitor has stored at any given time. So this is a square wave generator using entirely DC circuit components effectively. So you get a time varying signal from a DC circuit. It's really neat. So we are going to start with one specific assumption, okay? Assumed. DC, so let me label that, voltage across the capacitor. We're going to say that this circuit starts with VC is equal to zero and V out is equal to VCC plus. And I'm going to define this guy right here as a reference voltage. Okay, so if V out is equal to VCC plus and VC is equal to zero, that means that there is some current flowing through our resistor R, right? The one at the top, there's a potential difference across it. Therefore, there must be current flowing through it. If R is smaller in scale than the input resistance of the op amp, that means not a whole heck of a lot of current is gonna be allowed to flow into the input terminal. And so it's gonna start causing that capacitor C to charge, all right? And that capacitor is gonna charge at a rate of R times C because it's a simple RC circuit. So it governs how quickly and slowly it can charge the capacitor. When V out is VCC plus, V reference also has some fixed value, right? Because it's just a simple voltage divider circuit which tells us what V reference is. Again, under the assumption that R1 and R2 are smaller than um, the input resistance of the op amp. So what's interesting is that whenever 
VC reaches our reference voltage, our output swings to VCC minus, and then the cycle starts over. So effectively what's happening is something that looks like this. Um, sorry. So we're going to have, we plot this. So this is time. There's a capacitor voltage in blue. So it's starting at zero. And then it increases until it hits the reference voltage. Right. Then it's going to decay until it reaches negative reference voltage. Then it's going to charge until it reaches the positive reference voltage. Then it's going to decay until it reaches the negative reference voltage and so forth over and over and over again like this. So blue is VC. Well, V out is doing the exact same thing, but it's just going from VCC plus down to VCC minus, and then up and down, up and down, over and over again, as the capacitor charges and discharges. Blue is our input, green is our output. So let's take a couple of minutes. I'm gonna build this, oh, actually um, a couple of other things that I need to talk about just real quick here. Okay, it creates a square wave, that's all fine and great. Um, obviously the output amplitude of the square wave is dependent entirely on our supply voltages, VCC plus and VCC minus, but we do have control over the frequency, right? So I'm gonna define the frequency as this value. So it's just from when it swings negative to the next time it swings negative, or we could say when it swings positive to the next time it swings positive, just exactly one cycle, right? Well, period of each cycle, T, is going to be twice RC, because it takes one RC for it to charge and then another for it to discharge, times the natural log of one plus beta over one minus beta, where beta is equal to R2 divided by R1 plus R2. So our frequency for this circuit is variable depending on the component values. If we make either R1 or R2 a potentiometer or a variable resistor, then we have some small amount of control. We can dial in small changes in the frequency. And if we make that resistor R a potentiometer, that's how we can make large changes in the frequency. So we can set our exact um, resonant value of our, or our, um, the exact frequency at which our circuit oscillates by changing these component values. And uh, that's very, very useful for timing circuits and stuff like that. So this is how you can get a timing circuit without having a crystal oscillator or something like that in there. 
All right, so now let's circle back to LC Spice. So let me close this and open a new schematic. Start with my op amp. And way over here, I'm going to throw my voltage supplies in as per usual. Let's make this one five and this one. Um, so I forgot to flip it upside down, the, the second one. So I'm going to put positive five in here, but that means that the positive polarity terminal is five volts higher than the negative polarity terminal. And since the positive polarity terminal is at ground, that means this thing is at negative five volts. So I'm just being lazy. Uh, let's call this VCC plus. Minus all right. Drop a resistor in here. This guy is going to be R one. Here's R two. that oddly. This guy is my resistor R. This guy is my capacitor C. Here is ground. And let's just throw some values in here. Um, let's call this a 10 kilo ohm resistor. This one will be 5K and another 5K just for the heck of it. Uh, let's make this one 100 micro. And push me out, run my simulation, and I'm going to arbitrarily say one second, and that might be too long or too short, but I actually know for a fact that it's going to not do anything. So right now it's just telling me my output voltage is zero millivolts, okay? The reason for this is because I'm using ideal circuit components. So my transistor, or excuse me, my, my output is gonna be zero because I can't set an initial condition to start it with 10 volts like we did in our analysis. The only thing I can do is uh, the only circuit elements to which I can put some initial condition are the voltage drop over a capacitor and the current flowing through an inductor. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in a spice directive dot IC. Um, actually, let me see what node this is. Node 001. Dot IC, the voltage at node 001 is equal to, and I'm going to say, 0 0.1 volts. That should be enough initial energy in this guy to cause it to start oscillating. Starts, but I didn't give it enough time. So let's edit this to make it run for 20 seconds. Let's see what happens. 
So it takes some time. That that little amount of stored energy is enough to get this thing to start outputting my square wave. The smaller the amount of energy I put in the capacitor, the longer it takes to start up. But once it starts going, it goes forever until I disconnect this thing. Um, and again, the frequency here, which is looking like it's somewhere on the order of roughly two seconds or so, because it's starting a little bit before eight and then it starts again. Sorry, yeah, a little bit before 10. So somewhere in the order of two seconds, it's based entirely on um, the equation that I gave you with no derivation whatsoever. So. Um, so this is how you can make a simple oscillating circuit. And again, you can tune it to do whatever you want it to do. So this is how you could make a square wave generator. And then when we're gonna learn Tuesday, you could turn this square wave generator into a triangular wave generator by feeding the output into an integrator circuit. So you can make all kinds of interesting waveforms just using simple DC components. All right, that is enough out of me. I thought this was going to be over earlier than it is, but we're getting out only five minutes early. So, all right, uh, unless anybody has any questions, um, I'm going to be signing off. Uh, there is one other thing that I wanted to talk about super briefly. Um, homework one, I'm going to extend the due date. Nobody has asked me for it by any stretch of the imagination, but I am extending the due date until Friday or tomorrow to make it go in line with everything that I'm doing, where we're going to have homeworks due Monday, Wednesday, Friday, so that we never have them butt up into each other. Um, so if you submit your homework to me today, I will look at the formatting and all that kind of stuff and then send it back to you if it needs it to say, hey, fix this, and you can fix it by tomorrow at 5 p.m. with no penalty whatsoever. Does that sound groovy to anybody who's paying attention? All right. All right, uh, see you guys uh, on Monday.